Friends, welcome. You have dropped into our extended conversations. Uh, we have uh, branched out into these podcasts as a follow-up from the Black Hawk Grundy Mental Health Mental Health Awareness Breakfast that was held in May. And we had gathered a wonderful panel of experts for that breakfast, and we couldn't even touch so many things that they have to offer, just resources, advice, stories. Um, and so we decided to come forward and, and have more conversations and dig in a little deeper with, with each of the people that were on our panel. So um, Dr. Manraj Pada, we're excited to have you here today to join us. And um, thank you. Thank you for being here. Like thank you for here. doing the Mental Health yeah, Breakfast anytime. too. Anytime. Was that your first here. time at the Mental Health Breakfast? Uh, that was, yeah, my first time. <laughs> yeah. It's a great event, isn't it? It was. I was not expecting the turnout that you guys had this year. Yeah. Yeah. I thought it'd be like a room full of like maybe 50 to 60 people and there's a, a hall full of people. Yeah, yeah. So I think for your maybe over 700 people, it is. It's, yeah. a, it's a great event. Well, at that event with the 700 people that were spread out at the tables, we had sort of the bios of everyone so that our, our the people present at the breakfast could read about you and your background. Mm -hmm. So for the benefit of our listeners now and our viewers, can you just talk about, tell us about your background. Yep. So I am a... Um, doctor of I guess psychiatry if you want to call it um, I went to medical school in the Caribbean did my residency in North Carolina and now I am here um, working as a independent psychiatrist with Indy Point uh, on the inpatient unit as well as the uh, clinic over here at Black Hawk Gandhi. great mm -hmm. and I had talked to you before about you know there's such a demand there's such a demand in the field of mental health and I imagine that you had a lot of options to consider how did you land at Black Hawk Grundy mm -hmm. Mental Health and what has kept you here? Um, so when I was doing the interviewing process, I'm of course I'm from Vancouver, Canada, so I was trying to get closer to the West Coast. Um, so I did interview at a lot of spots in the state of Washington. Um, and then the a lot of other factors outside of just work played into coming here. Um, most importantly was like cost of living was a lot higher over there and starting off you know from scratch with myself my family it was gonna be a little more difficult um, and so we started to look more in the Midwest area I did interview um, this is the only spot I interviewed in Iowa but I did interview in some spots in uh, Minnesota um, even as far down south as like Alabama and what really drew me towards Black Hawk Grundy initially is where I was just supposed to be working was the people so I met Tom and all the other staff and everyone really felt like they wanted to be here and um, were excited to be here. And so I really saw myself working in this environment and um, that's what made us come over to uh, Unity Point. Excellent, yeah. excellent. So you mentioned that you work both in the clinic here and then you're also in the inpatient mm -hmm. setting. Um, after the mental health breakfast, we got great feedback on you know pe people really appreciating what we shared, but then we also sort of had some follow-up questions I wish you had talked about this. I wish you talked about that. One of the things that got brought up was the difference between, um, you know, we talk about uh, inpatient treatment for, mm -hmm. for mental health. And, and we, you know, we recognize that if someone is actively suicidal, that there are mechanisms to get them where they need to go. Uh, what, there's also, is there partial hospitalization? What, what are, you know, I think that I'm wondering if there aren't sometimes people are in a point where they're not suicidal, they don't want to end their life, but feeling quite desperate. Mm -hmm. Are What are, besides the outpatient treatment here and, and inpatient treatment in the hospital, are there in-betweens? What can people do if they're feeling desperate, yeah. but not necessarily suicidal? Yeah, there, there is a bridge in between the two treatment settings. I'm still you know, getting myself accustomed to all the resources that are available in the community, but um, we've been doing a lot of discharges to the crisis center. And so that's a, like a subacute setting. Um, it's voluntary. It's similar to an inpatient setting somewhat, but is not such a restrictive environment. And so you're still allowed to leave, come and go as you please. Um, and so that's kind of like a step down from inpatient and a step up from outpatient treatment. Um, that's the only in between that I am aware of as of now. But again, mm -hmm. I'm still really learning about all the resources available in Iowa. Okay, so as a psychiatrist, and when we talk about all the different helping professionals, we had a great array of helping professionals on our panel that morning. 
Um, is you, my understanding is your primary role is medication management. Is that how you would describe what you do? Um, yes, to a certain extent. Um, at times, also, you kind of are like the quarterback for the team. And so you're trying to set patients up with certain treatment modalities. And so I would say we're like the front line for patients. And then if we feel um, that someone may benefit more from therapy as opposed to medications because medications are not always the answer to you know every case and so we would try to get that you know or facilitate that treatment for that patient mm -hmm. um, and at times just strictly medication management okay yeah I like that analogy the quarterback of the team um, and I just recently we have been watching that Netflix special about the the quarterbacks thing and mm -hmm. how much information they have to pro uh, process in a short amount of time. And I do think that would be similar for you in that you, you, know, you are figuring out what is available and, and what direction you want to, to send a patient. So if, if you are doing um, medication management for mm -hmm. them, I'm guessing it's not an either or, like a therapy or medication. Can you talk to me about some of the things from your perspective yeah. that improve the effectiveness? If, if you are managing the, the medications for a patient, what, what else do you as the quarterback mm -hmm. like to steer them toward for sure. to help it be more effective? Yeah, um, I feel like a lot of it has to do with empowering the patient. Um, if you just kind of sit back behind a, a, a desk and just tell someone what they need to be taking and don't really provide them the education behind why they're taking it, it leads to non-compliance. And so I try to really make it seem like it's the patient's decision in terms of what they want to do. And so, you know, facilitating that conversation that could be tough at times, sometimes it could be very easy. And so finding that balance in terms of having or allowing a patient to have autonomy in terms of what their treatment looks like and providing them with options. Um, and then with, with medications, again, I, I do like to set realistic expectations with patients and I tell them, hey, you know, medications could probably only do so much or medications may not be the answer in your case or um, sometimes the opposite. You need medications to do better or function or, you know, we need to bridge you with medications until we can get you um, in the right state of mind for therapy. That, so, that's such a beautiful point to make, you know, that, you know, what I think sort of a, a farm a pharmaceuticals 101 just to help your patients understand what a psychotropic medication is supposed to be doing mm -hmm. it's not like you take this pill and then everything is better it's you take this medication and the hope is that you get to a state where you can take advantage of a lot of those other mm -hmm. resources so i'm i'm guessing maybe once some of your patients find a medication that works and they're compliant with it, then they might be more open and be able to really utilize some sure. of those other resources and practices and definitely and, and ways to health. Yeah. yeah. Another thing that you had mentioned before was the impact of moving your body on mm -hmm. t talk to me about how you ended up doing yeah. uh, that sort of that review of the research that's out there and what mm -hmm. you found. Yeah. So that was for like exercise and treating psychiatric conditions. Um, I did a uh, Grand Rounds presentation in residency on that, and so we looked at, a, or I looked at, not we. Uh, <laughs> I definitely remember those hours <laughs> I put into you. looking at all those research <laughs> papers, but um, I looked at several different studies that were done on exercise and its effect on psychiatric disorders, and in comparison to um, medications, in comparison to therapy, and in comparison to placebo. And um, a lot of the studies I came across showed that exercise was just as beneficial at times in terms of uh, treating psychiatric conditions as medications and therapy. Obviously, when you combine medications and therapy uh, together, that usually is always superior for um, most treatments. But just on standalone medication versus exercise versus placebo versus therapy, um, exercise was right right about there in terms of managing mostly anxiety and depression um it did help out with like the overall functioning of individuals with schizophrenia um but just namely for the anxiety and depression it showed to be just as beneficial um and it's you know amazing to see people benefit from um exercising for their anxiety depression and not only that you're also helping out with your uh, physical health, yeah. with your high blood pressure, you know, cholesterol, diabetes, and so on and so forth. Right. Um, in, in my experience, uh, 
working with clients, one of the populations that um, I found really challenging as far as compliance or maybe patients with their uh, medications and really especially figuring out, as the quarterback, figuring out what to try and what might work. Um, bipolar disorders were, mm -hmm. you know, are, um, really challenging. And a couple things that I noticed, and I'd like, I'd like to hear your thoughts on some of it. I know that with a bipolar disorder where the person is really just cycling down into depression and then back and down, in, whether it's a rapid or slower cycling, talk to me about why antidepressants aren't going to work for that mm -hmm. because you know you're not talking about depression to a truly manic phase but really just in and out of depression what's happening there why why would they not find success just with mm -hmm. antidepressants so typically with um bipolar disorder you know exactly like what the you know disorder says you have two poles you have a very high end and a very low end and so with bipolar disorder if you're just treating with antidepressants um you're only really treating the lows and it makes their chances of pushing into the highs uh, a lot more likely and so you typically want to you know prescribe them a mood stabilizer so you could find that balance in terms of the highs and lows mm -hmm. um, typically for bipolar uh, patients um, in terms of i guess suicide prevention you obviously don't want someone to be uh, depressed and that's where a lot of the suicidal thoughts will come in um, but when you push them into the highs is when they start doing things that they could regret later in life or start to affect them financially later in life as well. Um, for instance, I had a, a bipolar patient back in uh, North Carolina who was manic and gambled and spent like all their life savings. I think they went through, I think it was like eighty or $90,000 wow. in the span of a week with just giving it away to people or spending it or gambling it away. And then that set them back quite a bit. And that was money that they didn't even have and now you know it definitely is gonna you know dampen their their lifestyle or their financial situation probably for the next 10 years i would say oh, yeah that's hard to come you know recover from that would be very hard to recover from yeah. and then you've got all the guilt related to that you've got the yeah the effect on mm -hmm. on any of the people close to you yeah. and wow that's and so treating the the highs are just as important as the lows and again you don't want to predispose someone to falling into either or of, of those um, opposite ends of that disorder. Yeah, and and, um, and I, I can recall a client who really fought having medication for bipolar because she embraced the, man, the mm -hmm. mania, you know, she embraced those yeah. manic times. Um, how, do you, how do you deal with that when you have people that kind of like that feeling that they have when they're mm -hmm. on the high end, um, how do you how do you provide that rationale or talk them through yeah. uh, giving the medication? Um, unfortunately, sometimes you're not able to talk any ration to them because they're not really in touch with reality, depending on how severe the mania is. Mm -hmm. um, individuals typically like to stay in like the hypomanic phase mm -hmm. where they're really productive. They're not really doing anything that's too bizarre to the point where you know other people start scratching their head saying, hey, something's wrong with this individual and they need help. Um, and so they, it, it's tough to talk with individuals with mania or hypomania for those reasons because they like to be in those states. Um, and again, unfortunately, it's, it comes to a point where we need to involuntarily hospitalize them and involuntarily you know, give them medications to bring them back down to the norm. Um, and that's when they typically begin to see what was wrong and why what they were doing was wrong and why it was affecting them. And that's where a lot of like the psychoeducation comes into play, sure. saying, hey, this is your disorder. And again, when someone's manic or hypomanic, that's no time to kind of sit there and have a conversation about their disorder. Um, that's the time to stabilize them. And then once they're stable, have that conversation. So there's, you know, the timing has to be right in terms of the treatment. You can't just go in and tell someone, hey, you have bipolar disorder, you're, you're manic right now. You got to take your medications. Things will get better because, again, they don't have that insight at that time. Um, and they're not in touch with reality most of the time. So. Right, right. So I'm sure it varies from medication to medication, and even with that, from patient to patient. But when you're talking about an antidepressant, mm -hmm. what what kind of window of time do you encourage? How much patience do the patients need to have as far as knowing if the medication that they're taking and the doses mm -hmm. that they're taking, how long do do we as patients need to wait to know 
um, okay, this is as good as it's going to get on this medication. Mm -hmm. And, you know, what, what are, what's the time frame for antidepressants typically? For antidepressants in particular, you typically want to wait about, I would say, minimum four weeks. Four weeks. Until you see effect of the dose that you're taking. Um, and typically, to give it a fair med trial, you want to max out the dose. Um, unfortunately, psychiatric medications are not like traditional medicine. Uh, let's say if I have a urinary tract infection, you know, I take a certain antibiotic for a certain amount of days at a certain dose and it will go away. You know, depression is not like that. Right. And everyone has a different dose. Let's say if the two of us have depression and mm -hmm. we are both taking uh, fluoxetine, for example, mm -hmm. um, 20 milligrams may work for you versus 60 milligrams for myself. Right. And that doesn't necessarily mean that I have a, a, a worse depression than you. It's just what works for me is going to work for me. What works for you it works for you. Um, and neither of them may work in terms of the dosing and we both need to be on different antidepressants. So that's where it's it's tough because there's a lot of trial and error. Yes. Like I can't, and that's where the, you know, building the um, realistic expectations in terms of medication comes into play. Yes. So is it similar um, with a mood stabilizer medication? Are you talking usually typically about the same amount of time? Um, no. So mood stabilizers, so that's a, a blanket statement in terms of medications. And then when you look at mood stabilizers, you know, antipsychotics could be considered. I was, yeah, I was going to uh, ask about the antipsychotics too. And then a lot of seizure medicines are considered mood stabilizers as well. And okay. then uh, lithium is also a mood stabilizer. Right. And so antipsychotics typically tend to work the fastest. Mm -hmm. um, and then the, the seizure medicines such as Depico or valproic acid, lithium, um, carbamazepine, lamotrigine, those, those work fairly quick as well, but not as quick as antipsychotics. And that's why we typically uh, lean on antipsychotics for any uh, psychosis or mania went on an inpatient setting because you're in a controlled environment and we could, you know, see how you do on a day-to-day -day basis. Okay. So, um, I've heard, uh, seen, uh, um, documentaries and, and read a little bit about the use of, um, what is it, PCP or uh, mm -hmm. that, that kind of thing for, you know, within a ther controlled use within a therapeutic uh, setting. And and I'm sure that there are a lot of people out there kind of self-medicating, you know, trying uh, things in that world. What is the impact outside of a clinical setting where mm -hmm. we don't have our psychiatrist there? Can you talk about some of the impact of, of other drugs? You know, we, you know we're, the state of Iowa, we're surrounded mm -hmm. by legal marijuana, right? Mm -hmm. We just cross the border and, and your patients have access to marijuana. Alcohol is, is readily available. Um, and then there are other other drugs too that in in culture we hear or in the media we hear can help with that. Mm -hmm. What kind of what? How do you approach that if you have someone that is utilizing drugs? Yeah, and alcohol again, too? bringing the um, a lot of a lot of it has to do with education and educating people on what they're putting into their body um, and how it affects their their brain chemistry essentially. And so that's a tough part in terms of, you know, substance abuse treatment mm -hmm. is bringing that to light to individuals and, you know, having them understand what they're putting into their body, into their body could be harmful. Um, there are a lot of studies that are coming out now from Europe, I believe, and I think uh, it actually approved, uh, got approved by the FDA in Australia for psilocybin for, um, uh, I believe, PTSD treatment. Um, but again, people just see that psilocybin got approved for PTSD and now you could go buy it from your local dealer and yeah. you know use shrooms on the weekend with your buddies that's not how it works right. a lot of the studies and the efficacy is done on um, strict supervision you go to a clinic you um, use whatever substance it is that they're prescribing you in a controlled setting and you're monitored and then once you are no longer dissociating is when you get to leave it's not something that you're just prescribed oh hey here's a card to go buy Medical marijuana, for example, there's no dosing on it. It should be dosed, uh, you know, if you're trying to treat someone, there should be an exact dose of how much you, sh you should be taking. Um, and so it's it's tough to regulate, and I think that's going to be a, a huge barrier in terms of having a lot of these treatment modalities readily available for individuals. 
So we do have medical marijuana mm -hmm. in Iowa. So have you had have you had that come up much with the patients that you serve a um, desire to explore that for yeah, their treatment? It, it does come up, but there's no recommendations or no indications for any psychiatric disorders. And it rather does the opposite. It makes a lot of your anxiety and your depression worse. Um, and it could lead to an addiction because sure, may, people may feel a little bit better when they're smoking marijuana, but when they're actively high is when they feel okay. And then when the effects wear off, their anxiety and depression comes back tenfold and now they got to do it again and so then you find yourself repeating the use just to kind of numb the effects kind of like alcohol right right um and then that's what leads to the tolerance the dependence the addiction um, because now you're kind of leaning on something to help you out at all times mm -hmm. is it possible for someone who is taking psychotropic medications and I, and then this is way too much of a blanket question but if someone is utilizing psychotropic medication as part of their mental health regimen, um, is there room for social consumption of alcohol among that population? I mean, or, mm -hmm. or is given the way that these medications work, are you really looking at you're not going to have cocktails anymore? Um, it really just depends. It depends on the, the actual chemistry of the, the medication. Sure. And so benzodiazepines, for example, you don't want to be drinking with, with those medicines because they act on the exact same receptors. Um, so they act on the, I believe it's the GABA A receptors in your body. Um, and so when you use um, Xanax, for example, mm -hmm. and you drink on top of that, your body doesn't know the difference between the two. And that really increases your chances for overdosing. Um, and that's why one of the reasons the withdrawals with benzos and alcohol, they're the exact same and they're wow. treated the exact same way because they could eventually lead to you know seizures and death. Wow. So that's a big part of your patient education mm -hmm. is to talk to them, even if it's just, you know, going to a, a, a cocktail party mm -hmm. in the holidays, they need to be aware of, you know, what they're taking to be healthy and yeah. what that impact might mm -hmm. be. Yeah. And, and, you know, again, realistic expectations. I'm not expecting someone to completely stop everything. And if I am prescribing benzodiazepine to someone and if they have a, a big event coming up in their life or something where they want to have a few celebratory drinks, I, I would just tell them, hey, don't take your, your Xanax or your Klonopin or whatever it is that you're getting from me um, that evening if you're planning on having a few cocktails because I don't want you to you know, be out of it or yeah. have a, an effect that you don't really want or yeah. you know, not needing. Another thing, another... Um bit of feedback that we got after the breakfast was from the loved ones of those who struggle with mental health and in particular about compliance mm -hmm. you know medication compliance uh, and I know you know just in general accountability is not a bad thing right you know mm -hmm. like if there are things in our lives that that we know we need to get done that we should keep doing having someone as a source of accountability is not a bad thing how how do you how how are your parent how are your patients doing with that I mean I, and I'm kind of going all the way around here I'm thinking about adult patients that you have who may not have um, a partner a significant other they're living on their own mm -hmm. and and may struggle with compliance with their mm -hmm. medication how do parents of those adults um, or siblings of those adults how how do you advise them? You know what mm -hmm. what is what is supporting, what is empowering, and what is enabling? How do how do we help those adults that are struggling with mental health and yeah. are not compliant with their medications? Yeah, I would say being as supportive as possible and not being overbearing. There's a fine line between the two, and it's tough to you know tell if you're being overbearing versus just being supportive. Um, but from the outside looking in, it's a lot easier for me to say what you need to be doing than actually doing it um, because if you if you're overbearing and you're telling an adult what they need to be doing that's where like that counter will comes in and you don't want to start doing whatever you're being told to do because right. you're strictly being told what you need to be doing right right and so um, there's a again a fine line between support and encouragement versus overbearing and controlling mm -hmm. and so it's it's tough for me to tell where that exactly you know where that line lies in the family but that's what i tell parents or siblings is hey you know if they're gonna want to take medicines they'll take them just try to be there for support and encouragement and don't first thing in the morning hand them a, a pill bottle and say hey you need to take these right now mm -hmm. just continue to encourage them and instead of 
giving it to them or telling them what they need to do, ask them, hey, did you take your medicine this morning? Instead of saying, hey, you need to take your medicine. So mm -hmm. I think just giving those gentle reminders as opposed to telling them what they need to be doing is uh, a big help. But again, at the end of the day, if someone wants to do something, they'll do it versus not. Mm -hmm. And so... What's been the most effective for you when you do have, when you have had patients that the moment they walk in the door, it's like, I don't know why I'm here. I don't want to talk to you. I don't want to take the medication. What has been the most, what are some of the things that have been the most effective in, in helping them get comfortable with the idea that this might help? And this is something you may be doing for the rest of your life. How do you, yeah. how do you get people there? Um, it depends if, if they would benefit somewhat from medications, but you know, it's not something that I'm gonna, you know, lose sleep over if they don't take medicines. Um, I would just say, hey, if you don't want treatment, then fine by me, then you don't have to come in to see me. I'm not gonna force you to come see me. Come back and, you know, if you need help, I'm, I'm here to help, but I'm not gonna tell you what you need to be doing. Um, so that's one case. The other case is, again, a lot of the education comes into play. And then um, let's say if someone with schizophrenia, for example, um, comes in to see me and they don't wanna be taking their medicines, what I would do is I'll bring to light all the all the troubles they or all the struggles they had because of their diagnosis. And so, for example, um, if I had someone that came in with a history of psychosis, diagnosis schizophrenia, does not want to take their medication, um, and let's say I took care of them in the hospital six months ago, I would bring that to light and say, "Hey, do you remember this time when you're in the hospital? Um, you came in because you weren't taking your medicines, and these are some of the things that you're experiencing." And we got you better with medicines. And so I try to take them back into a time where they weren't doing so good and the medications helped them out. Um, and then sometimes, unfortunately, on the flip side, you know, individuals that need medications to function uh, and be a, a contributing member to society, that they, they need those medicines, we would put them on long acting injectables. Okay, uh, good, the injectable. I'm glad that you mentioned that. Because mm -hmm. I, I was thinking about how, you know, I'm familiar with... Uh, patches for some things and you know the birth control implants that trickle mm -hmm. medication out what what is a, is that an option for some psychotropic medications where they can make the decision that they want to be compliant mm -hmm. and something can be done and then they don't and then it's just it's how, how where does that work what kind of medications can yeah you do so that um, only antipsychotics have long acting injectables right now um, and there's only a total of six of them that do and there are indications are only for schizophrenia or bipolar disorder. Um, and so we can't really inject anyone uh, that has depression with an antidepressant medicine. They typically need to be compliant with the orals. Um, but with the long acting injectables, what you essentially can do then is just come into the clinic once every two weeks, four weeks, some are dosed out to you know two months and uh, three months, and now there's a new one that's every six months. And so wow. you first want to develop a tolerance or make sure that you don't have any adverse effects to the oral. And then you would um, titrate or, you know, change the dosages to find out what stabilizes you and then convert that over to the injectable version. Okay, so once they have established which medication mm -hmm. is effective, established the correct dose, and they've gotten clear through that period, yep. then you can start looking at having, mm -hmm. wow, six months, wow. That's that's probably saved some lives, I would imagine. Uh, yeah, that one one's pretty good. I have not used that one um, as of yet. I, I think for me to start using that one over here, I'd want to see someone stable on that same medicine for about a year. Okay, I was wondering how long. And then long, transition. Yeah. I'm not gonna you know stabilize someone over the span of ten days and say, oh, this is this is what works for you, and then inject them with something that's stu stuck with them for six months. Um, and so that's something again. I, I would transition to if someone's doing good for a certain period of time before I even consider that six month one. So now I want to kind of shift to your younger patients. Um, talk to me about when you make that decision that a child might need I don't, to I don't see kids. Okay. <laughs> yeah. How would a psychiatrist, there are, you know, are there, are there children that are put on psych, at what age, mm -hmm. you know, if we're talking about dealing with depression, because we know that there are some teenagers mm -hmm. that are dealing with some significant depression yeah. and, and have had recommendations for psychotropic medications, whether it's antidepressants mm -hmm. or mood stabilizers. Talk to me about how you as a psychiatrist, how you look at that population mm -hmm. and how you would want to approach it if you did have... Um, so there's no real indication to put a kid on an antipsychotic. Um, the benefits, I would say, do not outweigh the, the risks of those medicines. They come with a lot of side effects. You don't want to subject uh, you know, an adolescent or a child to 
um, affect so many different hormone levels and primarily dopamine. Um, and so if I were to see kids, I probably would not put anyone on a, an antipsychotic. Of course, there are the outliers where certain kids may require it due to their behaviors or their symptoms. Um, even with mood stabilizers, I probably wouldn't want to prescribe that. Um, but with antidepressants, we do that often in terms of treating any depression or anxiety, which are usually more prevalent for sure. children as opposed to bipolar or, or schizophrenia in the adolescent population. Sure. Mm -hmm. And then in terms of like treatment approach, um, we did have to see kids in residency. We did have a fellowship, however, uh, a child and adolescent psychiatry fellowship at my residency program. So um, the, the fellows typically would take the more complex cases and we would see more so like the ADHD or um, standard depression and anxiety uh, patients. Um, and we would also run the uh, child um, psychiatric emergency department consultation. And so what I noticed with treating children, and it's kind of sad to say, was most of the times it was just bad parenting. Oh. And so a lot of times, you know, parents would not like the way their child's acting and they would bring the child into the emergency department because they were going to have a family get together over the weekend and they didn't want their, their child to be there because they were afraid that the child's going to cause problems at home. Oh. And so a, a lot of times you would see the kids and they're perfectly normal kids and you call the parents and they're like, oh no, they're doing this, this and this at home and you're like, that's just a kid being a kid, yeah. right? And so understanding that you know a six-year-old is not going to be psychotic and it's normal for them to have imaginary friends, yeah. that, that's no reason for you to drop your child off at the hospital and not pick them up for three days and then later you find out that you had a weekend getaway trip and you just didn't want to take your kid to it. So yeah. it's kind of sad um, wow. and it's like the sad reality of it from my experience. Obviously right. that's just a snippet of what child psychiatry is. Um, but that's one of the reasons why I did not want to see kids. Yeah. I know there is a huge need for um, child psychiatric providers, but I just felt like it was an uphill battle that I can't really fix because I would see a case and see a perfectly normal kid sitting across the table from me and um, realize that it's just parenting that's kind of playing uh, a significant role in terms of why that kid's acting the way they are. Wow, yeah. Mm -hmm. and unfortunately, there's no medicine to, you know, make someone be a good parent. If that was the case, I'm sure the entire world would be taking it. Right, yeah. right. So going back to the parents of the adults, let's switch back to that that population. Um, when we when we have loved ones that are struggling with mental health and maybe pulling in substance abuse in with that too, and they're just struggling to function, they can't hold down a job. They you know that they um, are are going to end up homeless. When we are when we are the parent or sibling of an individual who is struggling that way with mental health, how do you, how do we find a way to know when we are enabling? them mm -hmm. if if we're paying rent if we're making the car payment if we're you know what we might be doing versus you know looking at nat natural consequences because i think you know when we're talking about mental illness the the natural consequences are kind of scary to think mm -hmm. about when when you're a parent or a sibling of of someone who is struggling um how do you help how do you help family members mm -hmm. navigate that how much is too much to do to yeah. help them again it's tough to say um, it really just varies on case by case. Um, obviously, when you're on the, again, the inside looking at the situation, and I try to apply myself to, you know, what the parent's going through and how I would deal with things. Of course, it's way different because I'm not going through what they're going through. Um, but what I try to tell individuals if they feel like they might be enabling or, you know, doing too much is, hey, try to apply whatever family dynamic you got going on with your family to a friend or some other family member. and. Um, try to think of what you would advise them to do. If you feel like, you know, your advice to that individual would be, hey, you're doing too much for your kid or your, um, your sibling or whatever, then maybe you're doing too much or, hey, maybe you're not doing enough. And so trying to remove yourself from the situation, put that entire situation onto someone else and kind of see what you would do in terms of advising that individual again a lot easier said than done yes um but that's the only way i could really help out because i'm not i'm not there in, in someone's home watching what's going on i'm really just again seeing a snippet of their life and whatever they're telling me and whatever's in front of me so it makes it tough yeah 
So in, in the psychiatric disorders and the mental illnesses that you your patient population deals with, um, our genet- we already t- touched on parenting mm-hmm. um, and, and, uh, and, and what your reflections on that, but are there genetic components that we might want to be aware of if we are an invig- individual? Like if, if I have struggled with anxiety mm-hmm. um, and then I have children, should I be more concerned that I'm going to have a child that has anxiety? Or yeah, how? definitely genetics come, you know, play a, a significant role in um, almost all psychiatric conditions. Um, and if genetics don't play a role, just being in that environment will play a role in terms of what the norm is for that child. Um, and even with personality disorders, you know, if you grow up watching your parent be a certain way, that's your mom or that's your dad. That's what your normal is, right? Yeah. And so whatever they are doing in the home becomes your normal and that's what you grow up to be. Yeah, so nature it doesn't matter if it's nature or nurture. Mm-hmm. If it's if it's present in your parents, whether it's genetics or environment, mm-hmm. you know, be aware that it might it might surface. Yeah. And and there is a I was actually reading an article on um, I believe it was alcohol use disorder and then they looked at individuals that were adopted and in different homes and so um, adopted uh, kids or biological family if they had uh, alcohol use disorder prevalent in it regardless of their um, their upbringing or whatever home they got adopted to whether there was alcoholism versus not if they had a, a predisposition genetically to alcoholism those individuals tend to use more alcohol um, versus the opposite where uh, these adopted individuals that had no alcoholism in their family and they're raised in, a, in a, a foster home or adoptive home with alcoholism, they weren't <clears throat> as inclined to use alcohol. So that's wow. where genetics come into play as well. Wow. I, I'm feeling almost excited by that mm-hmm. notion that, that the genetic tie is, um, is that strong and also can scare it a little bit. So so really, if, if an individual um, has is uh, has an alcohol addiction they really do want to be watching out for their kids for their kids too and that you know those phases where kids go Definitely. through and they're mm-hmm. um, experimenting with alcohol and and right along with a lot of their peers maybe we need to look closer when we have mm-hmm. that in our families yeah yeah that's fascinating so I know that you don't uh, treat child you know pe- you don't mm-hmm. have a pediatric practice um, I want to touch on ADHD a little bit. Mm-hmm. I mean, I know that there's a lot of medications out there for ADHD, and I know a lot of adults say, oh, I'm an undiagnosed ADHD. And um, Do you have much of that in your adult practice where people are coming to you with mm-hmm. complaints about ADHD and its impact on their adult lives? Um, yes, but I feel like a lot of it is driven due to um, personal reasons in terms of wanting stimulant medications Um, and so whenever someone does come to me with complaints of ADHD uh, I typically would refer them over for neuropsych testing Um, given that (coughs) methamphetamines are so prevalent in terms of its use over here so I don't know if someone's just telling me you know some symptoms they read up on Google before coming in to see me um, just to get a prescription for Adderall or you know Ritalin or Vyvanse or whatever it might be um, and so typically if someone comes in with concerns of you know ADHD uh, I don't want to say I'm discouraging people from coming in and complaining of or telling me about what's going on in terms of their symptoms with concentration and attention um, but what I would do is I would refer them over for the neuropsych testing to see if they truly have ADHD or is this due to anxiety or is it depression that's affecting your uh, concentration or are you just lying about everything because those tests could pick up on a lot of those things mm-hmm. um, and so if someone comes you know comes in complains of ADHD symptoms and I put in a referral for neuropsych testing they go get the testing done and then they come back and show me the results or the results are facto- facts over to me showing that they truly have ADHD I have no problem treating them with uh, stimulants um but from the year and a little bit i've been here and all the referrals i put in i would say a total of two out of like 50 have actually returned back with actual adhd uh testing results because um i think these individuals they learned that they're not going to get their medicine from me um and they will just go to someone else that will just start prescribing uh, stimulants blindly usually is what happens. Yeah. Um, and if someone does have a, a history of methamphetamine use, 
and they truly are struggling with symptoms which I feel are ADHD, I will still put in that referral. But before I put in that referral and you know um, make them pay whatever the copay is and waste their time going there, because it's like four hours of testing, four to five hours of testing, um, I'll tell them beforehand, you know, in terms of setting the expectations is, hey, regardless of whatever the um, testing shows, my plan is not to start you on a stimulant, it'd be a non-stimulating ADHD medicine. Because right. again, at the end of the day, these are still individuals, they, they're going to go pay their hard-earned money to get this testing done and, you know, put so many hours towards getting tested, I don't want to waste their time or money. Right. Um, so that's why I just kind of set the expectations before I even put in that referral. Excellent. That's good. You're mm -hmm. say, you're kind of protecting them from themselves in some cases. I yeah, guess. definitely. And again, I, I'm respectful for everyone else's time and, and whatnot. So I don't want to waste their time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, does your practice delve into dementia at all? Or do you have, mm -hmm. do you go into that world of medications for neuro um, not, disorders? Not, not so much. That's more of a neurological or neurology um, field, I would say. Uh, we do at times prescribe medications to help out some with the behaviors that are associated with dementia, but unfortunately there's no treatment for it. Right. Um, so there's nothing that we could do to really cure the dementia other than just kind of, you know, massing the symptoms of medicines. But right. uh, in my practice here, I don't have uh, many people with dementia that I see. Uh, most of them are usually just kind of dealt with... Uh, uh, by neurology or if they their dementia gets to a point where they need to be in a, a memory care unit Which is like a locked nursing home mm -hmm. um, They're usually managed by individuals that are or practitioners that are rotating through there to take care of the people there um, We when we were kind of getting set up today there was talk about um, some items that were in the room that were left by a drug grip and um, I, you know, we watch TV, you see commercials. I mean, mm -hmm. like just the average person is watching a commercial about a psychotropic medication. I'm sure that there's um, a lot uh, a lot of advertising, really. I mean, advertising, mm -hmm. whether it's on TV to the general public or someone stopping by and sharing information with you. How, as a professional, do you um, sort out and determine what path you want to take and what medication you want to take mm -hmm for an individual? Mm -hmm. what, what has influence on what you use? Um, I would say nothing has an influence on what I use. I use what I use based on my experience and what I've studied. Um, in my residency program, the chair of our program, he did not like having any um, external factors playing a role into what we are prescribing. And so we've never had any drug reps come in. Um, we've never had that influence ever really in terms of our residency training and I, I've kind of stuck to my guns in terms of not having any external um, influence in terms of how I prescribe for patients um, and so I really just kind of again lean on my experience with certain medicines and then I lean on my training and um, what I've studied in books and not you know biased research studies and so I do look at whenever I read any randomized clinical controlled uh, trial on a medication I would look at potential biases that could be confounding in the results. And so you, you always look at the funding of who was funding this trial. If the funding was done by the drug that's being tested, yeah. then I would say that there's probably some bias in that study and right. you know take it with a grain of salt if you want. Um, but yeah, I try not to be influenced in terms of um, how I prescribe. Does insurance coverage have an impact on what you prescribe? Uh, it does. It does um, sometimes. But again, with my training in North Carolina, the all these attending psychiatrists, they're pretty traditional in terms of their treatments and they would lean on things that work over an extended period of time as opposed to newer drugs that are coming out. And so I tend to lean back on them. But, you know, you obviously need to evolve with medicine. And so I do try some of the newer medications, not because... Um, a drug rep who studied a pamphlet is telling me what to do mm -hmm. as opposed to just you know leaning on my experience looking at the chemistry of the drug and how it interacts with the receptors and just trial and error i imagine that's challenging just to stay on top of it too i think i was told one time that um students that go into pharmacy like you know to, to become a pharmacist to get their doctorate in pharmacy by the time they graduate from their program a lot of the medications they were learning about their first year are not even 
as widely used or there's so many new. Mm -hmm. um, how, how are you supported to stay on top of what's out there and what's available and what's working? Yeah, I think um, interest in, in medicine strongly plays a role. And so just reading articles in my spare time, I don't mind. I don't, I mean, I'm not, I'm not a big fan of reading like novels or anything. Uh -huh. I don't mind reading like a, a study on a, a medicine that was done um, or just articles that pop up in my Medscape app or even just, you know, having discussions with other colleagues. I'm still in touch with like a lot of my uh, friends from residency. Um, two of my older cousins are addiction psychiatrists working in Canada. So talking to them about, you know, the new medications that are coming out for addiction and whatnot. Um, and so just through network and reading articles through my spare time. So what drew you to psychiatry? How, you know, when, when you were going through your education, mm -hmm. how, how did you choose that for mm -hmm. your path of residency and, and your field of practice? Um, and so for the first two years of medical school where it's just like basic sciences, a lot of the behavioral health courses were just a lot more natural and I don't want to say easier, but it yeah. just came a lot more natural to me. Right. It made um, sense to you. Yeah. Versus studying <clears throat> antibiotics for certain organisms or bacteria or viruses. I just did not find that interesting. Just mm -hmm. kind of sitting there memorizing things for the sake of getting through the exam is what right. I was doing essentially. Um, and then in my um, rotations in my third and fourth year is where you do your clinicals. And so a lot of the other specialties, again, not knocking down any other specialty, everyone in the field of medicine, you know, whatever they're doing is great and they're helping people out. But I just felt like I was just following algorithms online. And so if someone comes in with chest pain, you do X, Y, and Z. If the results show a, B, and C, you do, you know, right. E, F, G after that. Right. And then you just follow a pattern down a, a graph is essentially what I found we were doing. Um, and I didn't really find that fun. It was like the same thing over and over and over and over again um, versus like my psychiatric clinical experience. Um, it was very unorthodox and each patient or each individual's uh, treatment plan was completely different. And then on the inpatient setting, seeing someone from going like from being psychotic to going to you know a functioning member of society was pretty interesting in the span of like a week with medicines and so it was always different and always kept me on my toes and again you're not leaning on a, a algorithm telling you what to do you you go based off your clinical judgment and it's so subjectively objective in terms of treatment and mm -hmm. that's one thing i liked about it yeah mm -hmm. oh that's exciting that's that's pretty cool um one of the things that I've been asking each of our panelists when we go into these extended conversations is how you take care of yourself. Mm -hmm. So um, if you could share with our listeners, with our viewers, not just, you know, you've shared with us some of the things that you talk to your patients about, you know, thing, you know things that help their um, psychotropic medications be more effective or help their general mental health. There are things that you tell them, what do you do yourself mm -hmm. to stay keep your mental health fitness yeah uh, I mean it definitely takes a toll talking to individuals that are dealing with a lot of stuff and so what helps for me is completely disconnecting myself from work when I'm not at work um, how do you do that I, I just it's like a, a switch I have and as soon as I step foot off of Indy Point property I, I'm no longer Dr. Pat I'm just myself yes um, and so that helps me uh, being able to just kind of again fully disconnect not think about work when I'm not at work I'm not stressed about work. I'm a very low stress person. I never really stress out when I think it um, Bites me in my behind sometimes because mm -hmm. especially for standardized exams you Usually need to have some test taking anxiety to give you that push to study harder, but right. I don't have that and <laughs> I just sit there and I'm like, yeah, whatever happens happens. I'll just do my that's best good. and other and the testing time has probably yeah. serves you really well in life, yeah, right? That's, that, that helps me a lot. <laughs> Exercising helps out. I try to work out every day. Um, usually before coming into work, um, that's like my natural caffeine or my natural boost to getting the day started. Um, that helps out, you know, having a supportive family. And I think being the only one in medicine in my primary family, like I'm the only doctor in my family. Um, I do have cousins, a couple of cousins that are addiction psychiatrists, but they're pretty good at disconnecting themselves from work as well. Um, I think that helps because I've seen some individuals where um, there's multiple doctors in their family or multiple uh, mental health specialists or just 
med providers in general and all they do is talk about work when they're together and so um, I think being able to disconnect is is really big and um, not worrying about things that are not in my control mm -hmm. and so you know I'll worry about what is in my control when I have control over it as opposed to just sitting here worrying about something or about tomorrow I'm not worrying about you know how many patients I have to see tomorrow I'll, I'll deal with it when I get to it Right. I'm just gonna, you know, enjoy the moment that I'm in right now. I think that's what helps me the most. Right. Well, you've helped me yeah. enjoy the moment that I'm in right now. Yeah. I, I would I, say being careless, if yeah. you want to call yeah. it that. Yeah. 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 Embracing that a little bit. That's 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 great. Well, thank you again for for joining us with this conversation. Mm -hmm. I I think it's been nice to share um, even more information about the things that we touched on at the breakfast, and I just I really thank you for. For yeah. taking the time Thanks out for having today. me. Yeah. Was, this is fun. We should do yeah. it more often. Yes, we should. Yes, right we on. should. I think we've been talking about that. Like we, there, we can keep touching on other subcategories of this yeah. whole mental health world. So definitely, um, yeah, I think that would be great. Right on. That Thank you so great. much. Yep. Thank you. And uh, this wraps up this uh, extended conversation that you've dropped into. Note that the Mental Health Awareness Breakfast is a fundraiser for Blackhawk Grundy Mental Health. So I would encourage you to look in the show notes and find the links. And please, if you feel compelled, donate, Con do a contribution because it supports the important work that Dr. Pat is doing here, along with all the other professionals uh, that, are, that are here at Blackhawk Grundy Mental Health. And thank you for joining us.